as in the China Airlines incident almost a decade before. The Russian crew was confused by their automation. But in this case, they couldn't regain control until it was too late. The accident began not with a mechanical problem, but with a simple decision made by a very experienced pilot. I've never heard of anything like that before or since. It was very unprofessional on the part of the captain. The first officer also bears some responsibility for not raising major objections immediately. To allow someone unqualified to sit in the seat of a commercial airliner is unthinkable. The crew's mistake was compounded because they didn't fully understand their computerized systems. We've gone into a zone, a holding pattern. Ten years later, another experienced pilot gets confused by his instruments. And this time, the situation is complicated by a common sensation pilots are trained to ignore. Paul Morrow is an instructor at the Delta Connection Academy in Florida. His job is to put students in extremely uncomfortable situations and then get them to land safely. Upset recovery is where we take a student or any pilot and we try to get them the ability to recover their aircraft from an unusual attitude or an upset, such as weak turbulence, wind shear, uh, unintentional stall. We're gonna do a low level pass and bring right down to the edge of the runway and then just about halfway down, we're gonna break up and demonstrate how uh, quickly we can get the aircraft into a nose high situation. At that point, we're experiencing in that first portion of the pull up, we're experiencing the max G load in that turn. We're hitting just about six, six and a half Gs for that pull. Six Gs, you're experiencing six times your body weight. I weigh 200 pounds, so six times that. At that point, I feel like I weigh 1,200 pounds to my body. It feels like I'm being squeezed completely all over my entire body. It feels like your face is kind of peeling down over you. And it's just a, uh, once you get used to it, it's kind of fun. In a tightly controlled situation, with an instructor in the next seat, a student pilot learns to cope with intense physical sensations that can disorient and confuse. Pilots have to overcome these sensations and even ignore them. Trusting what your body is telling you can have deadly results. January the 3rd, 2004. A Flash Airlines charter flight is preparing to depart from the popular tourist resort of Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. 148 people are on board. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Captain Kader and his entire crew, we welcome you on board Flash Airlines Boeing 737-300. The captain is 53-year-old Kader Abdullah, a former officer in the Egyptian Air Force. He has over 7,000 hours flying experience. Clouds and sky clear. In the darkness before dawn, Captain Kader and his crew execute a smooth takeoff. Flying manually, they haven't yet engaged the plane's autopilot. But while still climbing, the flight plan is already beginning to fall apart. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? Overbank. Autopilot. Autopilot in command. Autopilot. Autopilot! No autopilot, Commander. In the morning light, investigators find no one has survived the horrific accident. The plane had just taken off, and it looked very strange why this accident happened so quickly after takeoff. French and American investigators join Egyptian authorities in the search. 
It takes two weeks just to find and recover the cockpit voice and flight data recorders. Investigators explored dozens of possibilities, including the idea the crash was caused by vertigo. Vertigo is a physiological condition, and it's based on the inner ear. Over a dark ocean, without a defined visual horizon, no ground lights, the pilot may not be able to perceive visually whether he was flying up, down, left, or right. And if the fluid in his inner ear was moving or he tilted his head, that may induce a sensation, a physiological sensation, that may cause the pilot to believe the airplane is flying straight and level when it's actually turning. Roger, when ready, inshallah. Left turn to establish 306, Charm VOR. As the plane banked over the Red Sea, it slowly began going off course. But the pilot says nothing. It seems that he's unaware of the changes to his flight path. It is actually a very high workload situation. And when there are no visual cues outside because it's a moonless night and you're over featureless territory with no lights in it, you really, as a professional pilot, should be totally aware of the fact that this is a situation in which you could get disorientated. Precisely what the captain perceived is unknown. What is known is that his control wheel slowly inched towards the right. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. How turning right? In this particular instance, not only are you trying to fly the airplane and understand situationally what's happening, but you're going through the mental gymnastics because your expectations are one way. Meanwhile, you have the first officer who's telling him something that's totally different. Even with all the conflicting information he was getting, investigators discover that Captain Kader almost recovered control of his plane. It is interesting that the recovery starts as the airplane turns towards the coastline. The lights on the shore would have given the pilots a clear and unmistakable view of the aircraft's attitude. This is the moment that the disorientation disappears, and this is the moment that the recovery begins. Sadly, there isn't enough time to save the aircraft. The tragic fact remains that Captain Kader had all the information he needed to save the plane right in front of him. The thing that is important when you're experiencing spatial disorientation or, or vertigo is to put absolute implicit trust in your instruments that they are telling you the truth and that whatever your sensation is, is a limitation of human beings. Trust the instruments. It's a lesson that's hammered home every day at the Delta Connection Academy. Brian Patricia is one of dozens of students here who wants to fly commercial passenger jets. It's a goal that's still years away. It should take me between five to six years at a regional airline before I move on to the major airlines. It's a typical journey. Senior crew members for international carriers often have thousands of hours of flying under their belt. But each one of them started with none. There's a very old saying, is, as soon as you feel like you're no longer learning with aviation, get out of it, because it's going to hurt you. Training is ongoing. Recurrent training is an integral part of safe flying. The reason we have the safe level of uh, flight that we do today is in very large part because of the adequacy and completeness of the training. Relying on your instruments, trusting your automation is one of the most fundamental lessons of flight training. Insert the ignition key, clear the propeller area, and then start the engine. Every safe flight, from small planes to jumbo jets, depends on pilot and plane working together. But even if a jet's technology is crippled, modern planes are so well built, pilots can still bring them safely down. August the 24th, 2001. Air Transat Flight 236 is carrying 306 passengers and crew. 
Bound for Portugal, the Airbus is in serious trouble high above the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you could literally hear a pin drop. The, the, the exterior, there was no sound in that plane, in that cabin at all. The airplane is so silent because it's run out of fuel. A state-of-the-art jet is now a very heavy glider. Functions we've lost. We have no more stabilizer. And yellow hydraulic. No ADR 2 and 3. No anti skin No reversers. The technology that normally keeps planes flying has deserted the crew. The jet is 10 kilometers in the sky without the most essential instruments. Captain Robert Pichet and co-pilot Dirk de Jagger have to find a way to get it safely back to Earth. For the first four hours of their journey from Canada to Portugal, the flight is unremarkable. We're getting to our next checkpoint. Every 30 minutes across the Atlantic, the crew had checked their position and their fuel consumption against their flight plan. 11.2 tons on the right, 11.2 tons on the left. Despite the computerized systems, some procedures like checking the fuel on board are done by hand. Fuel check complete. Level's normal for the distance flown. But then a small alarm breaks the air of routine in the cockpit. Look, we're getting a warning signal. Oil temp low and oil pressure high on number two. The computer display shows that the oil temperature is low in engine number two, but it also shows that the oil pressure is high. A low oil temperature indication is normally ind indicative of, of bad readings and bad sensor. Uh, oil temperatures don't decrease normally, they increase. A low oil temperature would, would be of no concern. The high oil pressure is, uh, is a very strange indication. Uh, it's, it's very rare. In fact, I've never actually heard of one. The oil readings are so unusual, the pilots believe they might indicate a computer error. But captain and first officer keep monitoring the oil levels. 30 minutes after the first alarm goes off, another warning sounds inside the Airbus. Fuel imbalance warning. Haven't seen that before. Follow our weekend action. I have air traffic control. In the Airbus 330, most of the fuel is contained in large tanks on the wings. The computer had detected that the fuel level on the right is significantly lower than the level on the left. Looking it up in the, the flight manual recommends transferring fuel through a special cross-feed valve. Fuel will then flow from one tank to the other. Once you begin a cross-feeding procedure to correct a fuel imbalance, restorative action should commence quite quickly. Uh, in other words, the situation would not continue to, uh, to get worse. Even though the crew is following proper procedures, the situation does get worse. Fuel quantity isn't rising in the tanks for the right wing. Check fuel quantity. It's very low. Hold on. It's much less fuel than we should have. It looks like a fuel leak. Check again. The systems monitor hundreds and hundreds of sensors, and, uh, you know, they can be affected by, uh, you know, such mundane things as a little bit of uh, frost or ice on a sensor can, can, uh, can cause it to pre present bad data. But in fact, the reading is accurate. There's a serious leak in one of the engines, and Pichet has been transferring precious fuel into the leaking tank. The fact is confirmed when co-pilot de Jagger completes another fuel check. According to the, all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be, according to the flight plan, and, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. With every passing second, the leak drains the tanks of their remaining fuel, until finally, the jet is running on empty. We're losing engine number two, I don't believe this. Okay, maximum thrust on number one. Um, what's going on? Uh -oh. Try to transfer fuel from center tank and the trim tank. Transferring. Fuel quantity is reaching zero. This can't be. We're 
not gonna go completely dry on this airplane. But in fact, the Air Transat has run out of fuel, some 12,000 meters over the Atlantic Ocean. No fuel means no power to control the plane. But the jet has one last trick up its sleeve, one last source of power. The crew deploys a rarely used backup system. It's called a ram air turbine. It will deploy from underneath the fuselage near the wing fairing. And it's, it's, it's a small propeller that deploys out the bottom of the fuselage and it spins in the wind. And that small propeller will provide very limited electrical and hydraulic systems to run the aircraft. In other words, although it's a glider, at least it's a controllable glider. When it took off, this Air Transat jet was a state-of-the-art marvel. Now it's falling from the sky, and the crew has to hope this last piece of technology will help them get down in one piece. A passenger plane has run out of fuel. The Air Transat jet is now an enormous glider with more than 300 people on board. The crew have diverted their flight from its destination in Portugal. The plane is now heading for a military airbase on the tiny island of Tertiera in the Azores. I saw flight attendants with life jackets in their hand running down the aisles. And obviously that was a, a sign of fear. Um, what, you know, what was happening was the first question that popped in my mind. If Captain Robert Pichet can't make it to the airport, his only other option is the ocean. But Pichet doesn't want to risk it. Planes aren't designed to survive landing on water. In 1996, a Boeing 767 ran out of fuel off the coast of East Africa. Its last moments were caught on amateur video. Of the 175 people on board the Ethiopian Airways jet, only 50 survived. Without vital controls, Captain Pichet and co-pilot Dirk de Jagger have to rely on each other like never before. The thought that a commercial airliner is going to find itself out of fuel with all the safeguards and all the redundancies is hard to fathom. This crew faced it together. Slots out and locked. The very design of the plane prevents it from dropping like a stone. Even without engines, the plane's forward momentum gives it some lift. It's falling fast, but it's still flying. Can you give me a landing speed, please? No engine, no flaps. Ideal approach speed is 170 knots. We're too fast. Yes. But the runway is very long. But at the end of the runway is a very steep cliff. Using the power available from the ram air turbine, Captain Pichet forces the plane to turn steeply, trying to burn off some speed. The plane was almost on a like a 45 degree angle. I thought it was just gonna, it was just gonna flip over and just nosedive straight down. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. Everyone on board survives. We got that plane down safely, only blew out eight of the 12 tires, <laughs> and saved 300 people. He saved 300 people's lives. Pichet and De Jagger have flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jet in history. News of their remarkable achievements spreads around the world. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? 
That's your main goal. And uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. So at that time, I guess the experience came in. Investigators discover that the leak on board the jet had been set in motion when the right engine had been replaced five days before the crash. We have to realize that there was a small uh, a mistake uh, made uh, in terms of changing the pump. Uh, we installed it, uh, but then uh, some pipes, uh, so to speak, uh, were needed to be connected to the pump, and there was a mismatch. The small mistake had crippled this highly engineered machine. But its very design left the pilots enough control to steer the plane away from disaster. At the Delta Connection Academy in Sanford, Florida, another student has earned his wings. After 14 months of training, he's one step closer to becoming a commercial pilot. We don't take everybody here at the academy. We want people that are motivated, that want to come, uh, that have a passion for flying. It's uh, a career that you've got to want deep inside to accomplish. Otherwise, you'll never make it through. Accidents have reinforced the need for pilots to understand the complicated relationship between crew and computers. The lives of countless people depend on it. Pilots take the responsibility for their passengers very, very, very seriously. Uh, we're responsible from the time that that passenger enters the airplane until they leave at the destination. The pilot's always the last line of defense. Automated systems make flying more predictable and dependable. But it's the marriage of computers and crew that ultimately makes flying one of the safest ways to travel.